Morning, everyone. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining this morning, especially to our distinguished panelists who are literally joining from all around the world. Um, they're shown here on this slide and will be introduced shortly. Um, so this panel is being held in honor of uh, Nelson Mandela Day, which was officially yesterday, uh, Nelson Mandela's birthday. Yesterday, if he were still alive, he would be 104 years old. Um, and I think as probably many of you in the audience are familiar, Nelson Mandela, there are too many inspiring quotes um, to even count, but one that I always treasure and use quite a lot in talks, uh, especially when I'm talking about research training is um, his quote that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change this world. Um, reflecting that um, throughout my own global health career, one of the um, most I think rewarding aspects has been the opportunity to work with young people who are committed to developing global health research careers. <clears throat> After I came to the NCI two years ago, I've been really proud and grateful to work at an institution that has really been engaged in global health since its inception, including training fellows from all around the world, many of whom have gone on to become international leaders. Over the last year, we at the NCI Center for Global Health working with other NCI divisions, including the NCI Center for Cancer Training, have really sought to better connect with such fellows at NCI, tap into their energy and optimism, and help create a stronger sense of community among them to and ensure that they're optimally supported throughout their NCI global health research career journeys, um, having the experiences they need to be successful in addition to the truly world-class training they're already receiving in their respective labs or research groups. Um, as a result of those efforts, um, we established a global health interest group this year. Um, and one of the first things that they were interested in and prioritized was the organization of this panel <clears throat> in honor of Mandela Day, which is focused on global health equity in the context of broader equity and inclusion efforts that are now ongoing at NIH and NCI. So we really have to thank them for today's outstanding panel discussion. Um, and so I'll hand over to Jack Murphy. Jack, please. Thanks very much, Satish. And hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jack Murphy. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the National Cancer Institute and a member of the Global Health Interest Group. Um, so first, I'm going to go over some quick logistics for this panel. Then, um, thank you, uh, Austin. Um, so just to be clear, everyone is going to be muted throughout the event, just so we don't have any funny sounds interrupting everybody. And uh, if you have any audio or visual issues, um, feel free to, to check the Zoom Help Center. Hopefully can help you out. And if you're seeing this slide, but you can't hear me or anything, then I recommend checking your audio settings. Um, and if, if your computer is having trouble, you can call in with the phone number that should be in the email you received for this event. Um, and a, a reminder to please submit your questions for the panel via the Zoom chat box. So we'll be monitoring the chat uh, during the panel. Um, so yes, please, whatever grabs your curiosity. Um, and as you probably noticed, this event is being recorded. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So here's a quick disclaimer that um, the NCI Global Health Interest Group is organized and run by postdoctoral research fellows here. So. The views expressed during this event do not necessarily reflect those of the National Cancer Institute itself. Um, and if you have any questions regarding funding of research and other issues related to the strategic direction of the NCI, uh, do please email nciinfo at nih.gov. So we were interested in organizing this event because we know the NIH is committed to promoting equity in global health research. And so reflecting this and in the context of broader equity efforts at the National Institutes of Health, uh, they recently published a request for information to gather ideas regarding how to better promote equity in global health research. Um, so those efforts are a large part of what inspired today's session. So in today's dialogue, we hope to discuss specific ideas and actions that the global health research community can take to achieve greater global health research equity each of our panelists today has experience in health equity promotion in not only different fields of public health, but also in different regions of the world. Um, and among other things today, we hope to hear some examples from them of, of what works, what perhaps doesn't work, and how members of an institution like ours can best contribute to global health equity. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass on to our um, global health 
interest group co-chair, Wadawiru Mburu, who will uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Jeff and Satish. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, we are very pleased to be joined by a remarkable group of panelists, and we'll have them introduce themselves for about 10 minutes. And we'll start with Dr. Rispel, who is a professor of public health at the University of Wits in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Rispel. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mburu. Should I should I go? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so firstly, I want to uh, thank the 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 Global Health um, Interest Group uh, for your leadership in putting together the spotlight on the critical issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in um, in global health. Um, I'm honored as a, as a South African and African, I'm very honored to participate in your panel discussion in celebration of Mandela Day, uh, which um, was yesterday. Um, as many of you know, Nelson Mandela's name is almost synonymous with the fight for social justice and equality. And when the United Nations declared International Mandela Day, uh, the Secretary General highlighted the alignment between Nelson Mandela's advocacy and a life uh, dedicated to, and I quote, uh, the inherent dignity and equality of people, both within and between nations, regardless of race, nationality, or belief, and the values enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Earlier this year, Dr. Mburu asked me what health equity means to me. Um, and I replied um, that inspired by Mandela and the many human rights activists around the world, um, health equity for me is a matter of social justice. It means that every person, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, geographical location, or any other label, um, enjoys optimal health um, and well-being. And I want to stress that health equity is not the same as health equality. But in fact, it means that we have to prioritize uh, those individuals or communities or even entire geographical regions that are who are most vulnerable in terms of um, the access to those things that, that determine optimal health and well-being. For example, uh, health, clean water and sanitation in education, um, what commonly are referred to as the social determinants of health, and of course, also health services. Uh, such as skilled health practitioners, vaccination, and that issue was highlighted, particularly during the COVID pa pandemic. So the panel asked me to talk a little bit about my own work um, and interest, and so I'll try to be very brief. But just starting off to say that my interest, advocacy, and work on diversity, inclusion, and um, equity were really shaped by life circumstances. I was born a girl child, in a small town in the rural and quite oppressive Northern Cape region of South Africa at the height of the brutal racist system of apartheid. Apartheid, as many of you um, might know, um, determined access to education, uh, privilege and other resources based on one's skin color. My first job after university was at the Red Cross uh, Memorial Children's Hospital in Cape Town in what is now the Western Cape province of, of South Africa. Um, the hospital exposed me to the inequalities and the contradictions of South African society. On the one hand, black children uh, died of uh, malnutrition <clears throat> and lack, lack of vaccination. And yet Red Cross Hospital was providing highly specialized surgery um, to correct complex congenital um, abnormalities of, of the heart um, of, to children from as far as field as Romania, Mauritius, and so on. So at the time, I met friends and colleagues who encouraged me to join progressive organizations, anti-apartheid organizations, and they also exposed me to critical literature about the injustices, inequalities, and discrimination in South Africa, but also in other parts of the world. I learned about the forces 
and the factors that shaped my experiences as a frontline health worker at the time, as well as the, the what accounted for the multiple layers of um, oppression that I experienced, particularly as a as a young woman of, of color and a health worker right at the bottom of the health hierarchy. At the time, I knew that I couldn't remain in the changes of healthcare delivery, but I needed to find a way of changing these broader structural issues. That opportunity came when I got a job as a researcher at the Center for Health Policy at Wits University in Johannesburg, um, where I was able to combine research and advocacy um, and at activism in anti-apartheid organizations. My role in CHP also enabled me to shape policies in a post-apartheid health policy um, in a post-apartheid um, South Africa. Uh, subsequently, after democratic change in South Africa, I had the privilege to join the Gauteng Provincial Health Department. I returned to the academy in 2008, and I've also had the opportunity to serve on the board boards of many non-governmental organizations, all with public health and or social justice activities or in their mission uh, um, and, and or their, their actions. Uh, currently, my research chair is entitled Research on the Health Workforce for Equity and Quality. It's the first chair at a South African or African university that focuses exclusively on the health workforce, um, also known as human resources for health. And you might ask, why is that important? Um, it's um, important because the health workforce is really at the core of health systems, ensuring health and well-being of entire communities or nations. And um, the health workforce is also important in translating the vision of um, universal health coverage into, into reality. Um, my chair also allows me to make a difference uh, certainly ultimately to health equity, but in, immediately my chair uh, helps me uh, to make a difference to the lives of young um, African women in particular, because I supervise the, the postgraduate um, studies, and I also mentor um, young health professionals, um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rispel. Um, as I've said before, you're such an inspiration, not only to me, but to a lot of people in the audience. So we appreciate you being able to join us and being able to share about your career path. We look forward to hearing more about your work during the Q&A. So next we are going to have Dr. Castro. Um, Dr. Castro is the Samuel Z. Stone Chair of Public Health in Latin America and Director of the Collaborative Group for Health Equity in Latin America at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Castro. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here to celebrate the life of the late Nelson Mandela. Um, I'm, a, I'm a medical anthropologist trained in public health. And um, what drove me to study public health is that as an anthropologist, I could, I, I would be able to ask very interesting questions, conduct great research, try to really understand the communities where we do our research. But I wanted to do more than that. And that's why I trained in public health to be able also to try to find solutions to bring more equity to societies where there is a great amount of social inequality. And that is now even made worse due to global warming. And uh, when I was asked to, to answer, to ask what was health equity for me, I thought I, that to me it is uh, to live in a world where sustainable health equity is a guiding principle for all sorts of policies, local, national, and international, that guide, um, that, that help improve health equity, but also in a sustainable way. And uh, I'm, um, I'm a professor at Tulane University since 2013. And before that, I was for many years in the faculty at Harvard Medical School where I taught social medicine. And I also volunteered with Partners in Health. And I had a lot of exposure throughout all these years working with Partners in Health 
to issues of uh, social justice and equity. And when I moved to New Orleans, I um, to, to work at Tulane, I created, soon after I created the collaborative group for health equity in Latin America, TELA, to make sure that uh, um, all the research that we conduct within this group has this intention to try to achieve health equity. We wouldn't be just asking random questions, research questions, just because they may be interesting, but also, but mainly because they try to solve an under an existing public health problem. And uh, next one, please. So in Tela, we um, we we engage faculty and students, postdoctoral fellows, and partners from other institutions with the intention of examining health equity issues and uh, to render visible underlying problems. For example, years ago in 2006, when I looked up issues of uh, women who had HIV, they were and who were pregnant most of them were diagnosed with hiv during their pregnancy and uh, in most countries throughout the, the region the latin american region the uh, most uh, public health recommendations were to just prevent the transmission to the future child but they were very few examples of countries that were trying to address the pregnant person for her own health. And um, that was a problem that we, that I thought that from my point of view as an academic, I could try to render visible so that it could be addressed. And that's what I find very exciting about conducting research to um, render visible uh, issues that affect lots of people and that where there are no policies to address those issues. And um, also the mission is to, to leverage uh, research and um, to, to try not just to document, but to try to mitigate national and regional inequities. The next one, please. And we do this through our collaborative platform. And uh, at Chela, we collaborate, we've collaborated at different times with the Pan American Health Organization or with UNICEF and uh, with academic institutions throughout Latin America, such as the University Iberoamericana in the Dominican Republic, and uh, where I work mostly with my colleagues, Dr. Laura Sanchez Vincitore and Dr. Robert Paulino. And um, also very importantly, we collaborate with the Health Equity Network of the Americas. Next one, please. So the Health Equity Network of the Americas, which is directed by Dr. Rocio Sáenz from the University of Costa Rica, is a network that was first established at the University of California, Los Angeles. And two years ago, we thought that it would make more sense given that although it is of the Americas, but it deals mostly with issues in Latin America, that the headquarters should be established in the region. And that's, uh, it's currently in the, at the University of Costa Rica. And there is a network of uh, people working at different institutions in different countries. We have Peru, Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, and the United States. And uh, we conduct multi multidisciplinary research and uh, we collaborate with other institutions closely with the Pan American Health Organization but also with the sustainable health equity movement in which I, I'm in the board of directors and I, in the executive committee and my previous speaker, Dr. Disha Rispel was one of the founding members of this movement. But, and uh, we conduct several um, research projects, but mostly directed and mostly directed to, to have an effect on policy so that uh, through research, we can help improve the lives of uh, many populations that are not, uh, that do not have the same access to services, of public services as other populations. The next one, please. So two examples of ongoing research projects. Uh, one is a project that I initiated some years ago in the Dominican Republic. And um, it's about the need to bring, um, 
people who give birth, mostly women and, and uh, unfortunately girls also, to the center of the care that they receive during pregnancy and childbirth. And the reason why it's so important to bring them at the center is that in many countries throughout the world, through extreme medicalization, uh, the, the clinicians are at the center of these processes. And uh, that is one of the explanations of the hyper-medicalization of care, but also because of underlying and um, underlying issues of racism and sexism and classism, the way that uh, women are being treated in health facilities, particularly where poverty, people who live in poverty are overrepresented, is um, it's this type of care is provided with a lot of violence and that's what's termed obstetric violence. So it's women are being yelled at, they're being disrespected, they are not being treated as if they were attending other types of facilities where people pay to get care. And um, we started this project first by studying women who had just given birth, then by studying the clinicians and doctors and nurses and administrators. And now through the Health Equity Network of the Americas, we're trying to bring this to a regional level so that we can collaborate with uh, people in other countries in the region and try to establish joint uh, goals to try to address this issue and make it more visible. Another problem, another project in which I'm working in collaboration with Dr. Laura Sanchez Vincitore is the uh, a project on poverty and early childhood development. And one of the first issues we encounter is that there was no instrument not to measure early childhood development. So we adapted an instrument from that had been developed in Malawi to be used in the Dominican Republic. And through some modification, it is now the, the official instrument in the country. So that has been essential. Such a, such a fundamental piece has been essential to try to measure inequity in early childhood development to have that instrument. And now we're conducting additional research to try to identify other areas. And if I can have the next one, the next slide, please. And that's my last one. Um, we have a paper published today about the role of sociodemographic and psychosocial variables that impact early childhood development. And our goal is then to try to work with public institutions to try to address those issues that we are identifying through research. And uh, this is just an example of some collabor collaborative research. On the top left, we have a health equity report that we conducted with in collaboration with UNICEF. And then the other ones on health equity is either part of the Health Equity Network of the Americas um, or in collaboration with the, the Health Equity Network in collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization and with the Sustainable Health Equity Movement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro, um, for sharing about you know, your collaboration effort. And we are very excited to hear more on how we can include health equity and sustainability in our collaboration with um, researchers from low middle income countries. So next, I will welcome Dr. Kanan, who is a surgical oncologist and the director of the Kachar Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Assam in India. Welcome, Dr. Kanan. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, celebration of uh, Nelson Mandela's life. And thank you to Dr. Rispel and Dr. Castro for that immensely inspiring set of talks. Next slide. I, I, I work for a, next slide. Uh, I work for a cancer hospital, which is in the far east of India. The previous slide, please. The far east of India and um, it's a, like, like many parts of the world, it's an area with mountains and forests and you know, streams, tremendous amount of rainfall. And, and the travel patients, people find it hard to travel to many parts of the region. And when people are sick, very often transport is a problem. And so they will fashion hammocks across a bamboo stick and carry them for long distances. 
slide please most of my patients are uh, poor people who work for daily wages earn small amount of money live in uh, houses which are not uh, pakka houses and have large families slide please i had the privilege of being mentored by some of the greatest proponents of equitable health care in the country both dr shanta and dr krishnamurthy believed in in making sure that everybody gets the kind of treatment that they need and dr shanta often used to say everything for every patient slide please and i think as medical practitioners as scientists as researchers if the fruits the end result of our research does not reach the last man on the street then that kind of research is of no value as an organization we take several measures that we have learned over the years to ensure that everybody gets access to reasonable quality cancer care and to that end we have resorted to pro poor proactive pro poor branding adopted a whole lot of cost reduction strategies reduced the waiting times and have tried to eliminate hidden costs as much as possible slide please see it is you know we started pretty simplistically um, you know thinking of low cost or no cost treatment boarding and lodging and then over a period of time we realized that many of our patients work for daily wages and since cancer treatment takes several uh, months to complete they lose wages and so they default on treatment and so we decided to provide you know ad hoc employment while they were on treatment we resorted to you know we started satellite clinics in host in districts around us we started making home visits we ensured that every patient who walks into the hospital today the same day their blood biochemistry workup is completed next day morning they have their biopsies and the imaging and within 24 hours the cancer diagnosis the stage and the treatment plan is ready thereby reducing waiting list we have a zero wait list policy for radiation for chemotherapy for palliative care for many of our services and then most importantly we try to ensure that our whole facility gives a pro poor impression we have a clean facility but basic there is no marble no fountains no glitzy structures because we believe that both in our demeanor the way we talk the way we present ourselves we have to give reassurance to the patients to the man who walks in that we will take care of them and so we've taken tremendous pains to ensure that our facility has a pro poor approach so and then we put in place other measures we started giving um, appointments and following them up on on phone call we ensure that we address symptoms the earliest the minute the patient walks in his pain is addressed and then we Uh, creative systems for resource mobilization and things like that the other important things slide please the other important thing is during adversities next slide please during adversities we have to ensure that you know we don't shut down the hospital for even a single day because when poor people are you know they are sick with cancer or other ailments and then they have floods or they have earthquakes or they have covid you know at that time if we shut down the hospital it's a it's a double whammy for all of them and so every time there's a there's a civil disaster we ensure that the hospital continues to function as normally as possible we've had back to back floods last month and the whole area was flooded we had more than 6 feet of water around us we managed to make our own rafts we kept our opds out at high rise areas outside the hospital and we kept the whole services running next slide please in order to do this we have to train our human resources and over a period of time we've had a number of opportunities to train our human resources because all of these have to be home grown and in difficult to access areas it is difficult to get people from outside to come and participate in healthcare slide please and then while we train our human resources we also have to create an environment that will retain the human resources and so we do a variety of activities to promote a sense of ownership in the hospital and so you know everybody in the hospital has a say in the way the policies are laid and the hospital is administered slide please and then just because we treat poor people does not mean that we provide substandard care quality of care has to be the same otherwise it becomes a monument to fraud and we work with a number of organizations slide please 
that, that work with us hand in glove to ensure that you know they promote our work both at, as organizations and several individuals across the country and across the globe who come and help us uh, do what we are doing better. Next slide, please. When I was asked what is my thought of um, equity in cancer care, I think equity is will only happen if it is inclusive. When I say that, I mean, you know, as an organization, as a government, as a process, as a system, we can ensure that, you know, we, we are equitable in what we do. We can have hospitals nearer their homes. We can provide resources as and when needed. But the end user, the target population, the community, the underserved population that we are trying to serve has to become a partner in this. They must be, see many of my patients, when they come to see me, they will come with folded hands and they will thank me for what I am doing, little realizing that I'm only doing a job. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so they must understand their rights. They must understand their access to uh, different schemes that will support them. And they must have a say in the way healthcare is delivered, in the way policies are planned. And only then, when it is truly inclusive, will we realize the dream of providing equitable healthcare. As, a, as, a, as an organization, we are looking at reaching out to different communities over the next few years. We are trying to put up several cancer clinics across the region so patients don't have to travel too long distances for chemotherapy or for palliative care or for morphine. We are creating communities in, for health, you know, where the community will take responsibility for its own cancer prevention, for health promotion, for early detection. And very importantly, we are trying to leverage technology as much as possible. You know, we don't have critical care specialists. So we put these high definition cameras in our ICU and we work with critical care specialists living, you know, 2000 miles away. And on a minute to minute basis, our patients have access to critical care. Slide. And after all this, we sat down and wrote our vision statement and wrote down our core values about a year ago. And we want to ensure that no individual develops a cancer that can be prevented, that no patient is denied appropriate cancer care for want of resources. No patient dies in agony and indignity induced by cancer and no family suffers treatment induced poverty and grief. Slide please. All of this happens only because you know we have a great team in the organization and we collaborate with a whole lot of people outside. And I think it is important for a community to understand what its goals are, for a community to understand what its rights are, the community have the ability to dictate policies in healthcare and for everybody from director to doorman to everybody to, to be in tune with the policies of the organization. Next slide, please. And we speak several languages in the hospital. And this is thank you in several of the languages that are spoken in the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanan. This is so inspiring. And we are so grateful to you for um, getting to learn from you, and especially in making sure that everybody has access to the best healthcare quality. Um, thank you for that. So lastly, I will welcome my fellow countrymate, Dr. Gitao, who is the Director of Research Capacity Strengthening and Interim Director of Research at the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, Dr. Gitao. Thank you. Thank you, Ariru. <clears throat> thank you for that introduction and thank you for um, inviting me to speak today and for the great talks that have already happened before me um, in introducing um, equity. So I'm gonna approach equity in a different way. And I'll start by stating that equity can only be achieved when researchers working with and on issues about the most vulnerable populations in the low and middle income countries are prioritized and properly equipped to address health needs irrespective of the geographic location, race or gender. So how can we properly equip these researchers? There are many conversations happening on how to better equip researchers in the global South to ensure that they are equal partners when it comes to research. However, despite the efforts made by global health partnerships between researchers in the global North and South, um, the, the partnerships tend to be imbalanced because of skewed economic and academic resources. However, especially after COVID, we currently stand in a globalizing world and our destinies are definitely interlinked and the origins of and solutions to delivery problems can be either local or foreign, but 
we definitely need to have partnerships that are equitable and equitable partnerships that provide for equitable capacity building at all levels. To successfully target the imbalance in economic and academic resources, global health research partnerships should focus on equity as opposed to the equality as has already been mentioned by my um, colleagues. And these partnerships need to ensure that they work together to um, redefine academic careers and priorities um, at, at, at the local level in, um, in, in low and middle income countries. So I come from an organization, the African Population and Health Research Center, who has been around for about 20 years and whose main focus has been to generate evidence and strengthen research and related capacity in the African R&D ecosystem while engaging policy to inform action on health and development. So how do researchers transform lives and why do we need to develop the capacities on the continent? The first thing we need to ensure is that research is done and that the evidence from the research is used in decisions that directly or indirectly impact lives and that research is done more and more uh, and by people and the evidence in, is used. And lastly, the people doing research use their expertise to support decisions that directly or indirectly um, impact lives. As an institution, our strategic objectives um, are four. The first one being to generate the evidence. And the second one, which is the focus of my talk today, is to develop capacities to strengthen the ecosystem and then ensure that the um, capacities that are developed and um, uh, develop research leaders who can use the research evidence and engage policy actors and practitioners for transformative um, change. Our program priorities as an institution uh, uh, are focused um, in areas of population and health that address um, um, issues that um, may lead to inequities in health, such as um, nutrition and food systems, sexual reproductive, maternal and newborn child and adolescent health, chronic disease management, health system strengthening, and emerging and re-emerging infections. We also focus on human development in trying to ensure that um, early childhood development and youth and transition to work is addressed in our generation of evidence. And we also look at gender and education, the, the use of education and technology and higher education research in, in its role in terms of ensuring that there's equity in, um, in health. Our work around population dynamics and urbanization looks at migration and urbanization, urbanization and sustainability, water and sanitation and hygiene, aging and development, determinants of high fertility and Dem demographic surveillance of, of many um, indicators that we look for in health. So as an institution, we have been focused and continue to be focused on building research capacity. We are big on partnerships for this and we, we uh, um, understand and accept that at the point we are at right now, partnerships both for, for North, North and South, South have to be enabled to ensure that there's equity in how capacity building is is built. We believe in strengthening uh, research and related capacities to help build human capacity for research and development, develop a clear and sustainable niche um, in different areas to meet emerging regional needs, produce and support skilled African re researchers to become leaders and become a go-to entity for research and evidence on research capacity strengthening and higher education on the continent. I'll very quickly mention our flagship program that um, has helped address building research capacity on the continent and how we also collaborate with partners in the North to enhance some of the capacities that we want to build. So the Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, CARTA, was built on the rationale that there is a scarcity of robust research and training infrastructure capable of attracting, training, and retaining the continent's brightest minds. The, when we started the work in Qatar around um, 10 years ago, we found limited capacity of African universities to pr produce globally competitive postgraduates. And, and lastly, there was, um, whether positive or negative, a weak preparation of the next generation of African scholars because a lot of the training was not happening on the continent and therefore a lot of our strengths as a continent were remaining in the global north. So the aim of the project is to enhance the capacity of African universities to lead globally competitive research and training programs, 
to provide multidisciplinary, uh, vibrant, viable, sustainable research hubs at African um, universities, and to create networks of locally trained, internationally recognized scholars. And please note, I will keep using locally trained, but internationally recognized, because that's one area of equity where we think um, equality and equity are equal, but they are not, because if we don't um, become internationally recognized, the status quo will not change. It is a partnership of eight universities on the continent, um, Makere Moy University in Kenya and um, University of Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, Makere is in Uganda. We have two universities in Nigeria, uh, Vets University in South Africa and the University of Malawi and the University of Rwanda. But we have, and as I said, recognize the fact that the Northern partners have um, a, a role to play to help us build the expertise and to provide the mentorship needed to build the um, research capacity. So we have um, a list of about um, 13 non-African partners from Canada, the US, um, Sweden, and Norway and Chile. And we also work with research institutions on the continent who have a strong research track record to provide us the guidance and mentorship that we need at the university level. One of the other areas of equity that we look at in our program is to ensure that we cannot leave behind over 50% of the population and that is the female population. So our work is very gender focused, even in our partnerships and in our training, we look at ensuring that we have enough women in the program. When we started in 2008, we had um, about 25% women in the program. In uh, 2020, we now have 227 PhD fellows out of this program, and I'm glad to say 57 of those are, are, are women. So we, we are at um, almost um, uh, at par in terms of gender parity. We're very excited to say that of the 227 fellows, the PhD fellows and postdoc fellows, 100 of them have graduated from the PhD, and therefore we've, we've gotten to the point where we're saying we have actually built a pipeline of early um, career trainees that can engage in the work um, in an equitable manner because they've been given the training and the expertise that they need to do. But we do recognize the fact that we do need to be in partnerships. And, and, and one of the areas that we, we understand and need to think about is how to build the um, adequate resources um, to ensure that the imbalance of um, economic resources does not hamper our fellows from graduating and, and for, for finishing. So we fundraise actively for the fellows to provide them with small grants um, at the institution. We also partner with many um, universities in the global north who have provided some resources, who provide mentorship, and who work with us to fundraise for programs that allow for partnerships and twinning and, and even providing postdoctoral uh, positions that allow for um, skills enhancement and transfer of um, and sharing of capacities. We are also looking at how we institutionalize some of the, the, the work that we do. And the main issue there is really to, to try and uh, work with the institutions to transfer some of the things we've learned over the years to, to work with the institutions to strengthen their research um, pipeline and the organizational effectiveness to ensure that they, once the Carter program is done in 20 years, um, that they can continue training the PhD fellows in the way that we've done and also continue with the type of partnership building that we have um, done over the years. Lastly, I'll talk about the work that we do in terms of enhancing societal engagement with academic research. We provide resources for opportunities for partnership and networking. We work very closely with local and national uh, county governments, especially um, through our fellows who are now some, some of them working in um, both regional and institutional um, tech uh, committees to, to, to drive the agenda and to um, drive the priorities that the African continent is um, um, addressing in terms of um, health. And we also work to ensure that our Carter Fellows are publishing and publishing not only in local journals, but in internationally recognized journals so that their work is well disseminated, but also transferred and um, beyond the dissemination um, put into place in terms of policy briefs, policy engagement, and implementation research that will allow for the adoption of the work. So 
as I close, I think I want to mention that our approach to partnerships is what we think will drive um, some of the equity that we need to have in research on the continent. We need to have um, evidence generation and use to meet several needs. The first one, as I mentioned, is capacity strengthening, and we really focus our work around capacity strengthening to ensure we have enough researchers. We need collaborations and convenings that will allow for, for us to disseminate our work, to engage with both the public and private sector so that they can start appreciating the role and value of research and um, uh, to address some of the issues we have on the continent. We need to embark on partnerships that will allow for knowledge translation. And lastly, without uh, partnerships with the communities that we work with, with the vulnerable po populations that we work with, we will not have the impact and we will not transform lives. So a lot of our research and our, a lot of our capacity building really is on how to ensure that our research actually plays the role of transforming lives at a uh, local level in terms of participation. So as I close, I think the point I want to make is really that we cannot um, ignore building the capacities um, at our local level. And these capacities have to have the ability to develop and um, plan and create their own research, but more importantly, come as equal partners on the research uh, table so that the, the, the resources and the engagements and partnerships at a global level between North and South are met um, at an equal um, knowledge partnership. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Yitzhal, uh, for sharing your inspiring work on research capacity building on the African continent. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. I'll now turn it to my colleague, Margarita, so she can take us to the Q&A session. Thank you all for these amazing presentations. Your journeys and your work are truly inspiring. And we are excited, <clears throat> pardon me, to hear more about you and your path in uh, the Q&A that we will have for the remaining of our time together. And again, we encourage the audience to please add any questions that you may have to the chat. And so I want to begin our Q&A by following up or continuing our conversation with a question that is directed to Dr. Ravi Kanan and Dr. Leticia Rispel. And so as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, you both have worked extensively with underserved communities in India and South Africa, respectively. Based on, on your experiences, what advice do you have for investigators that are seeking to work with communities that experience disparities so that we can first develop research programs that are meaningful to the needs of these communities? And also, and as you both mentioned in your talks, to ensure that the research that we're doing actually reaches everyone on, on the streets as you mentioned, Dr. Kanan. And perhaps we can start with you, Dr. Kanan. Thank you. So I think researchers need to understand the local communities and the, the, the research questions must come, arise from the community. The communities have to be stakeholders in this. Very often what happens is I as a scientist will write a project, get proposal, go and get it implemented. Ultimately, it may not be of relevance to the community. What we do as medical practitioners or researchers or scientists must ultimately transform life around us. And that will only happen if the research stems from the community. Thank you, Dr. Kanan, for raising that important point. And it also echoes with uh, what you mentioned about friends raising, which was also pointed out in the chat. Um, so I want to come to you now, Dr. Rispel, and your experience working with communities that have experienced racial disparities in South Africa. And we're wondering if there is anything you would like to add here in terms of the specific actions or those pearls of wisdom that must be taken at the organizational and or depending on which one you decide or the individual level so that we are working, we're doing work that is meaningful and that is ensuring that we achieve equity and justice. Uh, over to you, Dr. Rispo. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I, I think at the institutional level, it's important to uh, be quite explicit about the values of um, equity, um, you know, non-discrimination, social justice, 
so those have to be stated almost explicitly. And then, of course, um, then people have to, to kind of practice those values. Uh, uh, but I would say some of the aspects that are um, of importance, um, leadership, you know, leadership is critical. Um, and it's really for leaders to kind of like, uh, um, uh, you know, reach a very fine balance between highlighting those aspects that are, uh, um, you know, that are non-negotiable, such as a non-discrimination, and also to create an environment uh, where everybody feels included and where everybody actually feels that their opinion, um, you know, counts. Um, so the 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 I, I would say those are probably some of the key aspects at an organizational level because I assume that you're talking about you, you know research that would be um, that would be important and 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 contribute to um, you know to public health um, at an individual level I think it's important for researchers individually not to just uh, uh, you know talk about equity and justice but to also demonstrate that. In their um, in their own work, and and the most important thing is probably uh, um, to uh, you know speak truth to power, uh, particularly when there's injustice. And I know it's exceptionally difficult, um, you know, because you can be victimized if you're the only one who's who's sort of outspoken. But I think it's important, you know, to be able to um, to stay true to those uh, to those uh, values of equity and social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riskel. I want to extend this question to other panelists as well. Dr. Castro, I see your hand is up. You're on mute. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on Dr. Kanan's comment. It is extremely important to work in collaboration with the communities for a variety of reasons. And uh, but I do want to mention, for example, one example in the Dominican Republic with my colleague, we uh, held a series of workshops in um, the part of the capital city where most people live in extreme poverty before we started our research, because we wanted to understand what the priorities were. And uh, we knew from household surveys that violence against children is very prevalent in households. But we wanted to hear it to, to understand if that was a problem for the communities where that those things happen. And it, it came as, a, as a, a violence happening in all sorts of families in um, whether there were, mm, the mother was the only adult in the family or whether it was a mother and a father or whether there were other adults in the household. And it came as a very important issue. So we felt that it was appropriate for us as researchers to try to engage in this issue. But even, even um, the question is, how about if we only look at, see the information in household surveys, would it still valid? Would it still be valid to work on trying to identify violence? I think it is. Sometimes communities, um, they they may not know, for example, that uh, they there could be an instrument to measure the impact on of violence on early childhood development. But if we do share, if that is a um, when we had conversations about those issues, it clearly was very important for these communities to to pursue those research questions. But I wanted to bring another example. When we first started to conduct research on obstetric violence in the Dominican Republic, um, the women we were interviewing who had just given birth didn't necessarily interpret their experience as obstetric violence. But by asking a certain types of questions, it came up as something that happened very frequently. But unfortunately, because racism is something that is it happens every day at all times everywhere um, not necessarily everybody was trying to identify those issues that happen against them as issues of obstetric violence so i think that working in collaboration between communities and researchers is necessary i do think that researchers also have to contribute to to come up with research questions 
but I agree that it has to be in, a, a, in collaboration with the communities where those issues happen. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Castro. Dr. Gitao, anything you would like to add to this conversation? Yeah, um, thank you. And I just wanted to bring to the attention that um, as work from the African Population and Health Research Center, um, in terms of working with some of these vulnerable populations, as well as work in terms of building researchers' capacity to engage with them, this is an area where we have actually um, developed courses that address how do you engage communities? How do you um, partake in participatory research? With you know, we, our, a lot of our work is focused with adolescents um, and in terms of reproductive health. We have some work with violence against women. So it's not it's not as simple as just going out there and doing research with uh, um, for them. You actually have and co-create questions. Um, we have some programs actually that are, um, we call it our Youth Research Academy, where we're working with. Um, um, undergraduate students, and they're the ones who come up with the, the research questions um, with the guidance of researchers. So you pair them, and then you put the protocols together, and then hopefully if we have some funding, we put them um, moving forward. So I think the participatory aspect of research is really one way to ensure that you're building capacities of vulnerable populations alongside the other researchers that you're trying to build. Over. <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much for your valuable insight. Uh, we have an additional question from Waruiru, and then we'll jump into the questions from the chat. Thanks everyone for adding them. Yeah, I wanted to continue on that path of uh, thinking about local communities and the local expertise. Um, all of you have talked about, um, touched on the point of um, research building capacity and what's available, especially in LMIC. And I'll start with Dr. Castro and Dr. Nitao. And the question I have for you is, how can a focus on local talent and expertise be better integrated in promoting global health equity? And I think expanding that, a lot of us on this call are early career researchers. And um, I think there's a lot of you know, early career researchers in health income in high income countries versus low income countries, we kind of work like we're in silos. And we are always trying to think how can we collaborate and how can we work together. So I think the question I have for you to uh, both is how do we integrate local um, expertise in our research? And how do we enhance that collaboration, especially of early career researchers in different parts of the continent? Thank you. I, um, I think it is fundamental to engage local um, expertise. And even if it is at different stages, it could be students or postdoctoral fellows or faculty, it is absolutely essential. I, I'm at a institution in the United States. I also have students who need to learn how to, who need to get trained in in research skills. And I think that one of the most enjoyable experiences for them is to be trained alongside uh, researchers from other countries in their own countries, in their own settings. And not only they can learn methodological aspects, but uh, they learn how to work in another setting and to try to value, and they, they, they need to understand the value of working alongside the the people who are in the similar situation in the countries where they're from and uh, I, I this also brings me to an issue that is about the citation system how often do we read papers about a topic about a certain country where the only references are from the home institution of the people writing the paper meaning mostly the united states of america I, I mean, it happens all the time. And it could be that certain countries outside of the US publish in English, okay. But for example, I work in Latin America. Most of the research produced in Latin America is published in Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, it is still unfortunately extremely common for scholars in the United States to not cite that research. And that is very unfortunate. And we need, it's not just about a matter of uh, giving proper credit to people. It's the, just a way of completely neglecting a huge amount of research that is conducted. I remember years ago, I was at a committee at uh, uh, WHO 
and um, and I learned that there was a study about Chagas disease. Chagas, you know, it it happens throughout Latin America, and uh, the, the, the there are tons of publications published in Portuguese coming from Brazil and in Spanish, and uh, they had hired scholars from a English speaking country that did not know how to read Spanish or Portuguese to do a literature review on the topic of Chagas. I mean, that is absurd. And I, I know it from Latin America because that's where I work, but I'm sure that you have lots of experiences in other parts of the world where it happens. Maybe maybe the language is not as a barrier such as the way it is in Latin America, but it happens all the time. And uh, I think it's a shame. Thank you, um, Dr. Gital. Yeah, I, I'll pick up from where um, Dr. Castro has stopped because I, um, in terms of publications, we have a very similar problem. And, and the similar problem is that um, if, you, if you were to try and find publications on health on the continent, they're highly concentrated in English speaking countries. So um, the dominant countries, South Africa, Egypt, Kenya, um, I'm sure I'm leaving one, but they're all um, Anglophone countries. Yet we have a lot of research and a lot of work that's done in Francophone um, West Africa um, that is published in French. So the gaps in, in, in identifying um, questions, for example, is not driven by literature that has been published by French speaking countries. Um, there are early discussions about initiatives and, and, and actually it, it goes similarly to Portuguese countries. Um, and, and, and Lusophone countries on the continent, the, the issue there, of course, is Lusophone countries have probably adapted a, a bit more because a lot of their partnerships are with either Anglophone countries or with um, Lusophone countries in South America that are strong in English. So you have some publications, but you have a lot of publications that are not being um, cited and are not being quoted. And you also have um, a lack of um, awareness of African publications, those that are published on the continent, are not actually um, being seen. They're not visible, they're not disseminated. Um, but maybe just very quickly looking at another aspect of, 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 of how we think we develop capacity um, is through research. Um, so we recently published um, a study uh, which was exploring um, whether research capacity was built in the Global maternity, um, Maternal Sepsis Study, GLOSS, which was implemented in 52 countries across um, the globe. And some of our partners were from Brazil. And of course, there were partners in, 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 on, on the continent in Africa. And this work was to develop and strengthen reproductive health research capacity of local participants in low and middle income participating countries. Our findings show that well, when people are exposed to research, many people who were in the study expressed more interest in research um, as a result of participating in the study. You know, those from um, participants all the way to implementers, uh, to the, the clinical and data people who are, who are engaged. However, some of the participants in the research process identified the fact that they hadn't been involved from the beginning of the project in writing the protocol, in developing the data collection tools, and um, the main difficulty really for them is that because of that, they weren't capacitated to even understand the methodologies that were, were being done in terms of data collection. And so the implementation of the study would of course be hampered because then you data analysis was done by the Northern researchers. It was done um, outside of the expertise that had been built um, on the continent. And therefore, when it came to implementation, they were not as well versed with the methodology as they should have. And um, so from the participants they, themselves, they identified um, areas that need strengthening. And, though, and this is global, as, as Dr. Um, Arachi has mentioned, is you know all students need to be capacitated, involvement in protocol development, tailored training and technical support, depending on their role in the study. That, that should happen when you're designing research projects to ensure that local capacities are built alongside the research that is being done. And the aspect of data analysis and project management, really that should be localized. And the only way you can localize that is to build capacities um, as you do research on, um, in some of these studies. Over. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Gital. Um, I want to extend this question to Dr. Risbell. As a professor in a school of public health, 
um, you know, thinking about the need for publication, even for promotion and where this um, research is being published. There's actually a question in the chat, um, which is saying, how do we get past the citation issues? Um, impact factor also plays a role in why there's a dis are these disparities in citation. Is this even an issue that can or ever be resolved? So thinking about that conflict of as a researcher and you know, and someone who wants to be promoted, um, there's a need to publish. But then there's also the question of, especially if you're in LMIC, where are you publishing? Who is citing your work? And how do we also ensure that that work is not just about publishing, as Dr. Gitao was saying, but that we are actually involving the local talent and expertise? Um, so Dr. Rispel, I'll, I'll give the floor to you now. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, Dr. Mburu, the, the, it's really quite a complex web of, 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 of levels at which we would need to intervene. So my colleagues talked a bit about, you know, um, uh, uh, you know participatory research, about analysis, about citations. Um, but we need to recognize, you know, maybe just a, a, a additional things that we need to highlight. One is the role, for example, of funders or donors, you know, in, in skewing both research priorities, but not just research priorities, also um, a kind of way uh, um, in which institutions uh, um, they're going to invest. And it tends to be those ones that are strong that already have a global, you know, a global profile. So we would need to look at, I think today with, with your discussion, as I said, I, I, I'm, I really commend you on the leadership that you've taken, but you could probably have a number of other discussions among yourselves or with other panelists around issues of, uh, um, of, of funding, you know, and, and, and how do we begin to actually change uh, uh, that you know that level of of of, of stakeholders, um, you know. Recently, the 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 Lancet, for example, took a decision that they rejected a paper who had uh, um, uh, authors from the global north who had done work in a in a low and middle income country, uh, but there wasn't a single author from um, from the from the relevant country. And so, uh, so I think, you know, if we, we, we probably need to look at a combination of incentives and disincentives. So obviously what the Lancet did is a disincentive, you know, but we need to have donors, for example, who incentivize capacity building and, you know, equal partnerships with people from the, um, you know, from the global, uh, um, from the global south. Um, you know, the reality why uh, um, Ruero is that at an individual level, everybody would want to have promotion, you know, and because the system is designed um, at many of our institutions, um, it, uh, the system is designed in such a way is that it valorizes publications in international journals or high impact journals. It valorizes the number of postgraduate students that you've graduated. It valorizes the number of postdocs. It valorizes international partnerships and, you know, and funding that have been raised. And so to a large extent, the system is designed to kind of maintain the status quo for a long, for a long uh, way to come. And unless we begin to sort of slowly chip away at those issues, uh, um, um, you know, we, we're not going to, I mean, I think the first thing to, to state is that we're not going to change, achieve change overnight. Having said that, you know, as an activist, academic activist, I would say the for me, the first step is often a critical self-awareness, you know, that you actually need to look at whether you're not reinforcing some of those stereotypes in the, the way you do research or in the way that you interact with other uh, you know, with other colleagues. Um, and, you know, because I think that critical self-awareness will also extend then to broader issues uh, where you begin to raise questions around some of the criteria that are used at, um, you know, at institutional level. And when you make a conscious effort to actually uh, um, uh, level the playing fields, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure that I have quite a lot to, uh, to learn, but I try consciously to actually prioritize the mentoring of young black women in particular. 
um, um, you know, and I have a tech record of having achieved success. Um, and I can list, you know, some of the people that are in, in uh, very senior positions, you know, and actually acknowledge that it's because I've, I've listened to them at a point in time or I've given them advice or I've actually held their hand when they needed it, you know, most, you know, and I think that's really uh, what, what all of us need to do. And I also tell my mentees that it's really a loan. What I'm doing is a loan to them. They in turn have to make sure that once they've kind of reached the, 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 the pinnacle of their career, that they have to do the same, give opportunities to those who are younger um, and who, who might need an, an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all for this really insightful thoughts. Um, I want to continue our conversation, including some of the questions we have in the chat. And I want to direct our next question to Dr. Kanan. Um, so one of the questions that's there for you is how would you deal with the predetermined mindset of communities in terms of assurance of the treatment options and taboos that are related to it? And I was thinking that to add to the conversation, perhaps you can share from your own experience how involving local communities can help, you know, address these concerns. So I think, I think to build confidence in the local community, the organization has to walk the talk. See, what we realized, you know, uh, over a period of time, initially, you know, I thought because they were all daily wage earners, so they were not able to come for treatment. We started providing ad hoc employment during the course. So every time we had a solution, I thought that's the big, big uh, game changer. And that is going to make everybody come and have treatment. But what we realized over the last few years is every time we do something to support patients, support families, support caregivers, we go to their homes, we start satellite clinics, they reduce these are all confidence building measures. Each of them per se is not a game changer. All of them together sort of bring into the minds of patients, you know, that maybe these people are okay. I, my, my feeling is in, in low income countries, middle income countries, most, where especially a lot of treatment is out of pocket. Most people are afraid to go to hospitals because they think if they go to hospitals, they will lose whatever money they have. And so they don't go. They default. They go late. And so this, this is very essential for the system to build confidence in the, in the uh, community. And that, that takes time. That takes effort. It has, you have to prove yourself every single time that you, you deserve it. This is a privilege to be trusted by the community. It's a privilege. The other thing is they also have taboos. They have local doctors, local native medicine people, alternate streams of doctors. In, in my own community, see, for treating cancers, we have to do a biopsy. And the minute you say a biopsy, they will all disappear. They think a biopsy means the whole cancer is going to spread all over the body and they will die. And it's slowly, you know, it takes time talking, conversation, going out into the community. Every time there's an opportunity to talk about it. And this, this there's no other way but to do this deliberately time and again, 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 and then things will start changing. But, but then it is teamwork. Everybody in the organization has to speak the same way. Everybody in the organization has to be reassuring. Everybody in the organization must make time when a patient accosts you on the corridor, you have to take time to stop, stop everything else and address this issue. And then only will, will things change. You know? And it can happen. Thank you, Dr. Kanad, on that issue of building trust. Um, yeah, I think that's really important, but I think researchers a lot of time are very much in a rush. They want to come in, do the research, and they are out without thinking about the need for doing research. And also appreciate the fact that you said trust takes time, and it's something that has to be redone every moment. Just because you have built trust once does not mean it's going to remain. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to address another question, and this is to all the um, panelists. Um, and I'll let you know the panelists decide who's going to start with this. So the question is, how helpful do you think having more accessible data to inform what is happening at the service delivery level 
is in addressing equity, the general concept of democratization of data. And I'm just going to expand this to thinking about who owns data? Um, when we have researchers from high income countries coming to low middle income countries, and you know, as Dr. Kanan mentioned, they have a cancer registry, the data is there, you know, they take it, they come back to the US or Canada or Europe, and you know, they have their first order, their last order, they're not involving people locally. So that question of who owns data, um, what's the role of data in health equity? Um, and how can we work collaboratively in ensuring that this data is being used for the right purposes? And then the research actually comes back to the ground to inform health policy. Um, who would like to go first? Go ahead, Dr. Castro. Great question. I wanted to bring an example. Um, some couple of years ago, we were working a research proposal that involved analyzing samples from people, saliva samples. And um, my university has the lab capacity to analyze those samples. And the country where we wanted to conduct the research didn't have it. So what we proposed, it was not funded though, but what we proposed to the NIH was that uh, we, the samples stay in the country where they're being collected forever and that uh, uh, some uh, trainees in that country went to my university the first year to get trained on how to analyze the samples. And then uh, the people in my university could go to that university to actually do the lab work with them. And uh, they would only be sending a small percentage of the samples back to, uh, to my university for quality control to make sure that the results were similar in both countries. So to me as a PI, it was very important that the samples remained in the country where they were coming from. And uh, we were asking the ideas that we asked people for the possibility of keeping the samples for additional research in the future. And uh, to me, it's very important, again, that those samples stay in the host, in the original country of origin and that all efforts of training are directed towards training the people in the country where the samples come from. Um, I still hear, I'm not making this up, I still hear people in the US, academics in the US thinking that they're gonna go to another country, uh, collect samples and bring it back to the US. I mean without any interaction. I, I don't know where that mentality, I mean, I know where it comes from, but I don't know how it's still prevalent. And we definitely need to do every effort possible to prevent those things from happening. And I say this from an institution in the US. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gital. <laughs> Great, I'm smiling because I'm, 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 I'm I... I'm going to approach this in two ways. Um, uh, data and data governance is a double-edged sword. And I'll, I'll start from the point of, yes, we need to govern data and protect data and to ensure that um, it does not transfer um, and it needs to be um, exploited as it should be, all right? So that those who provide samples, such as patients, um, get the return on their investment in participating in research. So they get the research done, data made more accessible for them to, to actually get the results that they need. So, so that's, that's the framework that we should be encouraging at all times. Then the framework also is that it should also be used to develop the right capacities on the continent, etc. And I'm talking from a continental perspective. Now, because of the exploitation of um, data from uh, the South, going to the north and people, you know, you, you hear the narrative of careers have been created, yet no one has, has benefited in the South ETC. We've embarked um, in low middle and, and in, uh, LMIC countries on, on a, a couple of journeys. The first one is to put a framework in place to stop that type of um, data misuse. And this is great. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to be misquoted and say that this is a bad thing. This is a very good thing. Um, on the continent, I think there are only four or five countries that have actually got data protection um, policies now in place. Most of the others are draft policies. But now what has happened is the interpretation of those policies for research have not only disabled 
northerners from accessing research. It's disabled all researchers from accessing data, all right? So the double-edged sword is when we are governing, where does, do the health researchers come in trying to ensure that policies that are, you know, the guidelines that go with the policies allow for research? Because both you and I, when I was in active research, when you collect patient, um, you have, um, I think it is unethical not to do the research that you said you were going to do when you consented for that research, okay? And that means that includes capitalizing on the data and ensuring you answer most of the research questions that you wanted to answer. So there is that, that effort as researchers that we need to engage with regulatory frameworks to ensure that we guard the data, but guard it in a way that it doesn't block research. Now, the second aspect that we as APHRC have embarked on, I don't know if you've heard of the Countdown 2030 project. This project is um, enabling policymakers to understand research and data use and how they can um, even look at methodology ETC. So we're building capacities for policymakers to use statistical tools better so that they, they can actually evaluate even um, data analysis themselves. Because one of the barriers of data use um, is because they actually don't understand what modelers are doing. You know, so, so all these fancy data analysis are done, then you present it to a policymaker. He doesn't have the ability to check out the robustness of that analysis, ETC. So we are working in a couple of countries on the continent that trains um, policymakers to to understand the analysis, not to do it themselves, but really to be able to interpret and, and do uh, meta-analysis, for example, so that then they can uh, enable the use of the data for implementation. So uh, as I said, data democratization is, is, is something we need to have and do. We need to guard against misuse and misuse can fall into the aspect of um, you know, the pilot research that um, Dr. Castro was talking about. But on the other hand, we also need to ensure that when what we said we would do when we consented from a patient in terms of the research, that it's done. And so not creating uh, barriers, but creating frameworks that, um, um, that uh, allow for ethical use of data. Over. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Gital. Um, Dr. Rispel? So, so I think the question, you know, uh, for me, uh, the, the, the initial question was whether greater access to data um, would actually make a difference. And I think the short answer is yes. We need to recognize, of course, that so both Evelyn and Arusha talked a lot about biological samples. And I agree with all the points that they've said. Um, but I think the question initially talked about administrative data. And there, I do think we could learn a great deal from uh, community activists um, in the, you know, at the height of the HIV epidemic. Because um, to a large extent, if you spoke to anybody, a person living with HIV, they were able to tell you um, not only, they were able to explain in detail drug interactions, you know, the actual physiological action of a particular um, medication, as well as its side effects, and they would monitor that, you know, and that was really um, about putting health in the hands of, you know, of people. Um, and so I think when we make data available, we need to recognize, first of all, that there are different stakeholders. So Evelyn was talking to a large extent about policymakers, and the kind of data that we would give to policymakers would obviously be very different to the kind of data that we make available to, uh, to communities. Um, um, but we need to do it responsibly. And I think what probably fundamentally uh, um, uh, is, is, is the issue around data sharing. Um, uh, so in general, I think it's a good idea, uh, especially administrative data sharing um, in an understandable format to communities. But we need to recognize that in some instances, there's very low trust of communities, you know, for those who govern. And that, of course, will influence the extent to which people will really believe some of the figures that they, uh, um, you know, that they get. So again, I want to just sort of caution that it's a process. 
you know, that that it's not a kind of like a once off event and that we would need to take into account issues around trust. You know, how do you make sure that the data um, is not only accessible, but that it's ex accessible in terms of availability, but also accessible in terms of, uh, you know, of understanding. Uh, targeting the data to different kinds of stakeholders, recognizing their needs, and ultimately, you know, some process of interaction where people are able to ask questions and where you're able to explain what the data really, um, uh, really um, uh, means. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rispal. Uh, Dr. Fanana, I'll turn the question to you as someone who runs a major hospital, collects data. Um, what would you like to add to this conversation? I think the data belongs to the community from which the data is collected. They have a right to know what is happening. The outcomes of all research must be given to the community because I think it will help improve the quality of care through different ways. And so this is one thing that we must understand. The other thing is, I think one of the, we spoke about publication bias and references and all that, you know, a lot can be overcome if all our research becomes open source, if it is available on the net for anybody across the globe to, you know, uh, see if it fits their interest and it is accessible. In India, we have started what is called the National Cancer Grid, which is an association of about 270 odd cancer centers, research groups, patient lobbying groups. Several people have gotten together, several organizations, and one of the, and the National Cancer Grid encourages multi-center research in palliation, prevention, and in a whole lot of cancer-related topics. And one of the mandates, the prerequisites for funding or support from the National Cancer Grid is the data should be open source, that it should be once the research is completed, the data must be available on the net for anybody to access and use subsequently. I mean, there will be protection, there will be anonymization, all that will be there. But then this data, so it does not depend whether you publish or not, whether somebody cites you or not, all that doesn't matter because the information is available across the globe. People can learn more easily from what is happening in a small secluded corner of the country across the globe and it can actually make a global impact. Thank you very much all for those wonderful thoughts. So since we are almost out of time on our session before we move on to our fellow or trainee only session, I wanted to give you all 30 seconds to give us some parting thoughts that you have for the audience and specifically some suggestions on how we can start driving change in our research institutions and advancing equity. Um, so yeah, what a final piece of advice do you have for the audience? And maybe we can start with you, Dr. Castro. Well, those of us in institutions in the United States, whether you're a postdoctoral fellow or a uh, full professor, we absolutely need to take all those things that have come up today in the conversation and other additional issues into account when we grant grants, where, for example, we want to collaborate with other people, where our institutions want us to be the prime recipient of a grant. And uh, how do we make equitable research when our partners are in other countries and they also should be the prime institution? So those things need to be discussed openly and the way we conduct research throughout academia needs to change definitely thank you dr gita do you want to continue okay, great thank you so um i'll close by saying uh, global partnerships are inevitable and desirable um and however the issue of being underrepresented as a uh, global researchers from low and middle income countries is an issue. It's a growing concern about um, the imbalances we see in authorship and in, 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 in promotion and in resource sharing when it comes to equal partnerships. And these power asymmetries in the production of um, um, research and um, the benefits of knowledge really need to be addressed. But, but we do have a responsibility ourselves as African and low and middle income country researchers we need to ask ourselves, as um, uh, Letitia had mentioned earlier, is who we, who are we doing research for as Africans? You know, the, the, the term in literature is our gaze. Where have we, where is the gaze coming from? And then um, what position are we producing data from? Is it from a 
an, a selfish individual perspective. I'm going to become a researcher if I collaborate with someone from Liverpool and not necessarily someone from Brazil. You know, these are questions. How do we pose as researchers, as African researchers? What is our responsibility to ensure that we actually drive this equal partnership discussion um, by being more global rather than individual? Over. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Gita. Dr. Rispel, would you like to give us your closing remarks, please? So um, I want to end with the with the Maggie. I want to end with a quote uh, who's not that's not my own, which is actually uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Gandhi, who said, uh, "Be the change that you want to see in the world." Um, because I think it's a lot easier for us to control our own actions and our own uh, deeds than it is for other people. So, and, and I guess my last thought linked to that is, is around the importance of, um, um, you, you know, uh, of recognizing uh, the value of learning from one another and from, from others. Uh, because I think once you're in a position that you think you know everything, then it's really a recipe for, for disaster. So, so I think it's around always be a lifelong learner and recognize that you can learn from both those who have power, but sometimes the greatest learning and lessons come from people um, without. And that's, that's the group of people that we really have a responsibility uh, to, especially if we're concerned with health equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rispel. Dr. Kanan, the floor is yours to close us off. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think we were all created unequal. Some of us have more wealth, some of us have more knowledge, some of us have more expertise, some of us have more skills. All of us here are privileged. And we were deliberately created unequal because whoever made us thought that we would use what we need for ourselves and then the excess that we have, we will use for the benefit of people who do not have all of this. And if we keep that in mind, our research, our clinical work, our, whatever we do, you know, we will impact positively on life around us. So research, we must focus on the community. We must give back to the community. Healthcare, we have to give back to the community. That's it. Thank you so much. Okay, so it looks like we are more than about time. So I want to thank you all for the practical advice and for really prompting us to think and reflect on what health equity means to each of us and how this shapes our path. I want to invite uh, trainees or fellows to stay with us to continue the conversation with our panelists uh, for the next 25 minutes or so. We'll take a quick one, two minute break and then we'll meet back in this same room. So please don't leave and thank you all for joining us today. This was an amazing conversation. Thank you for your questions and until the next one, have a great day. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.